Hi, everyone. Welcome to Ladder Daily Digest. I am Maven. I'm without Gene today. He's uh, with family for uh, due to some unfortunate family circumstances, but he's doing well. We wish him well. I'll be introducing today's guest who has written a book. And I know, I mean, we go with podcasters a lot of times, and but we've also been bringing on a lot of authors. And this one's really kind of a unique collection and it's about realizing and learning new things about yourself especially in the context of a lot of foundations of maybe who you are and and how you view the world can get really rocked and and the ways that we what I liked about this was ways that we pull from other stories around us to be able to connect and have those realizations so I am going to bring on Alicia hello Alicia hello how are you good good so since Gene's not here, I'm, I'll start with his typical question, which is to, to give us your Mormon story, your, your quick five minute Mormon story leading up to the writing of the book and what inspired you to do that. So where does it begin for you? Yeah. Um, so on July 12th, 2015, I read the CES letter um, and I went to church that morning and but like 30, it's a 93 page document if I remember correctly. And 32 pages in, I, I was done despite like having been raised, you know, in the faith. Yeah. Um, Wait. Was you, done and just my belief was shattered. You read it church, or you were sitting there reading it in church? No, it was after church. Oh, okay. So you had gone to church that morning and then got 32 pages and, and then you were done? Is that, I'm hearing it right? Yeah, I'd heard about it in the news and was like, okay, like, what is this? Because I think it, it had been published in 2013, so it's been out since then. And and then I was like, what is this? And checked it out and didn't <laughs> didn't take long. I did, over the following year, I read nine or ten independent books on church history, and it 97% roughly validated what the CS letter said. Yeah. You know, it wasn't, there wasn't any statistical significance between what was in the CES letter and what was in these books from these hardworking historians. You no, know, like, did you feel like this is anti-Mormon material as I'm, as you were reading it or? Um, I was, I'd been an open-minded Mormon for about a year. Um, actually that was a product okay. of going to, I went to Montana to work for a nonprofit that provides nonpartisan info about candidates and that, uh, I also worked as a, as a journalist or a newspaper there and I worked under a guy who, um, the Smithsonian recently featured. So I learned a lot about how to think mm. and and realized um, just, I realized that things that had been claimed as as anti-Mormon were just possibly just, you know, just research and writing and things. Yeah. Um, I want, I, I, I don't want that to come off as they like took me away. I just basically was just going along in my career, you know, yeah. and um and just as a part of just part of a part of some careers is just coming to an understanding that when an institution wants to protect a narrative and and only have certain information for people to see then they claim something that isn't true about the information and so um and so then that I, I was too because that's your job as a journalist sometimes to find the truth behind maybe what is wanted to be hidden yeah. 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 So these jobs in Montana were were journalistic jobs. One flat out was, and the other one was very much that way. So, so I at least just made me be like, you know, like open me up to just like, okay, if you if you read anti if you read what the LDS Church is called anti Mormon material, you actually aren't. You're just reading history. But I also had a sense that the the history was not what the LDS Church said. Even despite three years prior, when the when media was reporting on Mitt Romney's campaign saying the LDS Church whitewashed its history, I was like, no way. But even but three years later, I was like, yeah, like that's possibly yeah. true, you know. Yeah. But I wanted to know, I, even though I foresaw that it could completely change my life and shatter my identity and worldview, you know, I still wanted to. Um, was that really scary? Did you? 
was that, did that feel kind of scary for you or, or were you think like it might, but it probably won't. So I think it's safe. And then like it did anyway, or were you like, I think it will change, but I met just at the point where I don't care and I have to know anyway. For anybody who's seen the matrix, when Neo is presented the red pill and the blue pill, and he's like, blue pill is going to, things will just continue as normal, but you live on the matrix and that'll be how it is. Or you read, or you do the red pill and life changes forever, but you know, you know, you know reality. And that's how it was for me. And in the character, the character is perceived as like, he's like, it's a huge moment. Cause he's like, okay, like this is going to. And so that's how it was. That's how I felt. Um, like. So you perceived it at the time. You, yeah, I think so. It, it sounds like you did perceive it as a, a red pill, blue pill moment for you. A hundred percent. CES letter was the red pill and not was the blue pill, like straight up. <laughs> um, so what, what happened next then? Or like, where did, I don't know if you're, if, if your family's still in, is this what did this cause conflicts there? Is it something you felt like you had to hide, or what, what were your next steps after that? I was very public as a writer, I was very public about losing belief and things I'd learned. And um, so it was really difficult with with my parents and a brother um, for some time, and then things improved and we were kind of compelled to reconcile but we did but then that only lasted for like eight months because then i came out as transgender as a transgender woman and that's not what the book's about at all but um it definitely with my personality it definitely overlaps um i so so in terms of like religion and and myself and so um so now it's you know gone like it's like yeah, I. It's it's too bad because we'd we'd recovered we'd recover from the Mormon differences, but or yeah. LDS, LDS. Yeah, and then there was a new hurdle. So, I'm sorry for that. That is rough and unfortunately really, really common. Is it? Um, I guess I want to ask about the book, but I also don't want to skip anything. Um, but I, what I, what I liked about this book was all, all the kind of different avenues you took to learn a lesson or, or relate a lesson that you learned. Um, did the idea for this kind of start around? Oh, uh, yes. I, I wanted to speak to that. I'm sorry. Yeah. There is a connection. There's a genuine link. So okay. So I, I studied journalism. I interned for the Deseret News. I did it in Montana, I, et cetera. And then I was like, I'll just like, move, I moved back to Utah and I was like, I'll just like live like a life of just working like a white collar nine to five, not even in my degree or anything. But then I learned about church history and lost belief instantaneously and everything. And so then I got really passionate about like, I was like, wait a sec, I, I believe I have a skill. And I, and so I became very passionate about applying that skill to learn the truth as these historians have done. And so then I got like way into in the journalism and I started writing even for free and things. And in doing that, I know there's a debate about if you like have that skill, if you should just do it for free or not. But at least in doing that, I was able to uh, be connected with Thought Catalog, which is the publisher of the book. And, um, okay. and then the book resulted. So the book resulted from my passion to write about things that I've realized are true and and realizing that the church is not true is what made me passionate about about doing that. Yeah, I I can relate to because I feel yeah, it just it's just so it it's so reality altering that first of all like, it's it's there's a process of kind of working through it and then also looking back on your experiences and having to kind of reframe them all over again. Um and there's, that does involve a lot of reflection and unfortunately a lot of regret for either missed opportunities or our past behavior towards others. And then for me, like it's some some anger, you know, and at feeling and betrayal, like that being lied to in order to coerce me into making these certain decisions that I might have I might have made different ones if I was really thinking for myself and what was best for me and where my passions lie. And so that's also like what I became passionate about speaking was 
shortly after my deconstruction. And there was also a family death that kind of spurred it on even more because that I just really felt like a, a connection to like, this is the one chance that we have. And if I'm not happy now, or if I want to speak rather than waiting in the future for the perfect time to to think it all out and make it all perfect, then it's just never going to happen. And then, and you got to start now. So um, I think a lot of people feel that way. It's or when, when such a drastic change happens, I think naturally um, we have a lot to think on and reflect and, and reconsider all kinds of things in our, in our lives. So do you have any thoughts or, or comments on that? Oh, just that I'm really sorry about the death, Raven. That's really sad. Yeah. It's and it was a young person too, which I mean, I, I think that we know that we could leave this life at any time, you know, it could be a car accident tomorrow or something, but it's still sometimes it, it takes something close to you happening to really pull it into your actual reality to really consider it. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, yeah. um, but yeah, so I there were a couple things, so I, I read the book and um. It's got kind of an interesting title, actually. Do you want to give us the title, and then I'll I'll jump into some of the the parts that I that I guess that stood out to me. The title is Star Wars is still intact, and then subtitle Refinding Yourself in the Age of Trump. Yeah, so um, it's a unique connection, and, and this has to do more with the it was the 2016 era with the Trump's initial inauguration that time period, right? And it's it's kind of now that we're circling yeah, his back. First, to his, first, his first term, hopefully yeah. only term. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can we can hope. Um, so yeah, so there's there's just it's kind of like a collection of little essays relating to yeah things out in, in. Well, I guess the Star Wars and Trump is current events, but there was a story that you gave, and I, I assume you found this story through maybe your history deep dive or maybe through something else that you were doing um, as part of your journalism career. Maybe you can can talk about that more, but um, it was about two women that I had never heard of before. So their names were Mary and Anne. So let's see, Anne Hutchinson and what was Mary's last name? Dyer. Dyer. Yeah, Mary Dyer. Okay, so they were both Puritans. Um, but they also had a faith crisis, basically, right? And um, and they were very outspoken, which I think both as like, if we're looking back at that time period, especially for women to be this kind of outspoken um, and, and, and facing death because the Puritans did kill people who they viewed as heretics. And so uh, I, I mean, that's the one blessing about today is that I, don't face death for what I do like these women did. So it, it just amazes me that people can just feel so like have so much integrity and, and strength and really, you know, be willing to do that. Um, so, yeah, so that was an interesting story to me. Um, Mary was hanged and think she, I think Anne was Anne killed first. Sorry. I'm, I, I liked the story, but I don't have the details like solidly in my head. I think Anne was, was executed first and Mary her husband was able to kind of stay her a little bit. Um, am I remembering mm -hmm. it correctly? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wonder if they expected yep. her husband to kind of control his woman. You know, maybe maybe that's kind of what they were hoping for, or banking on, and letting her go. And and uh, she, I I don't know. I guess, but um, I I imagine that that's probably what they were thinking. And then, but yeah, that's not who she was. So um, overall, it's a really sad story, but. Luckily, it's a piece of history that we moved on from. So that one's kind of unique because that one goes into the past, whereas the other stuff is is more current. So how did you how did you hear about Mary and Anne and um, and what um, how did they get included in in your collection of essays? So I honestly can't remember how I came across it to be totally real. So I'm really sorry, but um, no, that's fine. I I can't remember everything but, I come across either. Yeah, but it yeah. Uh, uh, but it, what's interesting also is that they still, for what it's worth, they, I mean, I don't, if somebody is atheist or agnostic, it's fine, but they actually believed in God still. They just didn't have a Puritan take yeah. on it. Yeah. Um, and so, and then just the hypocrisy of, of the Puritans has stood out to me so much as well um, that they left England to be able to 
worship uh, and believe and, practice and apply that belief as they as they wanted. And then some of the they were the they became the they they became the oppressors. And yeah. so it's just their irony is just so sad. And and I Mary Dyer has made a huge impact on me because I'm so touched that she stood up for for what she believed even to the point of death and I tr I have not I have gone to some Thanksgivings because my friend uh had me had me for Thanksgiving mm -hmm. and I was sad because otherwise wouldn't have had one because of family and also because of this belief though but so I went yeah. to, I went I took up I took up his invitation it was good for me to be able to go but I don't we I I'm I'm not like saying we shouldn't practice Thanksgiving, but we need to practice it for different reasons though. It's not Yeah. It's not that yeah, that's it. It's another whitewashed history, just like the history of the church was to always make us look like the heroes or the the persecuted bunch. And it's just it was everyone else that were the mean and nasties. And honestly, this is just the the country's version of that. So I, I see the parallel there where it's just you know, this was a great happy meal where everyone was like joined together and it ignores, you know, just like with the, the Mormon side of things, our hand in atrocities and the things that were done to other people that are, are never talked about. So, um, yeah, I see the parallel there. Um, yeah. And there were, and so there was, there was several Thanksgiving dinners. It's, I think it's like with Joseph Smith shooting back in Carthage jail, like these things make sense, but it's like, it does show how whitewashed the history was though. Like we just yeah. don't. I'm at the point. I'm at the point now when I when I'm given historical information, I really just go like, yeah, that's probably true, <laughs> because I've because I have gained a testimony. If you know, <laughs> if, to buy the that um, that the, the what we what the history's been a a, a book. A amazing book is what is lies my teacher told me, and it's not the teacher's fault. It's just the title. Right. It's just the attractive title. But but that like what what we grew up in and what other kids are taught in school it's it's not accurate history though, it's just it's been it's been whitewashed yeah yeah, and I I hope we can keep it going I feel like we're I I, I don't know I maybe this is part of the political climate because I I feel like we're torn as a country between people who want to to know the messy stuff we, we we've gotten to the point where we're like we, we just want to know and and there is a loss of identity maybe and a loss of pride in that to have to look at the messy things in the past and try to deal with it in constructive ways but then on the other side i think both in you know american u.s history and also in church history there's a lot of people who are really dedicated to the whitewashed model and and really want to be seen as the heroes and the saints and, you know, the good people and that there's something really much bigger to be lost by addressing the true history. And um, I guess we'll see who wins out kind of, cause this is, I feel like it's kind of up in the air right now, who's gonna be able to win and take control of this. So so hopefully I, I prefer truth because I think you, we can move on from that. I, I feel like we'll always be held back if we if we can't face it and you know address it. But yeah, so I agree so that was one... with what everything you just said. Yeah. <laughs> so what's um I, I guess I'll I want to hand this the next one over to you. Is there an essay that that you want to bring up or or tell a story behind um a, a new another realization, um either from Star Wars or or from Trump from this time? <laughs> I can talk about Star Wars all day, but I recognize that that Trump is a lot more important because that's real. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, um, I, I don't know. I feel like we'll, we'll get people in the audience. I mean, I, I feel like Star Wars is, is real, too, in the sense that it, I mean, it's, it was a cultural phenomenon. Um, but I guess Trump has, has come back around and is, you know, more culturally relevant again, whereas I think Star Wars, I don't think they're doing anything. At least I haven't heard of anything new or any new movies they're bringing out or anything. So it just kind of happened that way, I think. They they are, but it's still going a lot. But yeah. we can let's talk about Trump. There's always bit. more. So, what, what, how about even just generally? Do you want to kind of make this Star Wars connection just just for the audience to to know, like, why in a general sense that was meaningful to you? Yeah, that's no problem at all. So, for my from for me myself, 
I it was difficult for me to this is where okay, this is where gender comes into it for me. I really struggled to accept myself because we were in an era of craziness. As and like, you know, I think just the product of that is Donald Trump. And he's putting forth messages that I think make it difficult to, as do Mormon leaders, as do other leaders of right-leaning religions. It's just, it's very, I think it's very difficult, right? It has been at least, including during Trump's presidency, to accept yourself because you're getting so many messages of like, we are not going to approve. Or you're just flat out gaslighting. Like you're, you don't, you don't know who you are. And so, um, and rights are in jeopardy. So I'm finally at the point where I'm past that, but yeah. I still do love the franchise of my youth that impacted me profoundly. <laughs> so was that kind of like maybe like the the franchise coming back from your youth, like maybe kind of wrapping up like your new identity? Because like because yeah, the earlier so... day, right, I don't know, or maybe I'm seeing more of a connection than 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 there is, but I, I, that's what I'm seeing is that. I, Initially, like with the initial franchise, this is going back into your childhood uh, as one identity. And then now as an adult with all of these changes, you've got new identity and a lot of chaos and confusion. But then also this thing from the past also comes back around at this time. And is that is that what I'm hearing right? People who know me well are going to think that I changed and that that they're that like this doesn't make any sense. You're not a woman. You're not. And mm-hmm. there were there were things in childhood. I I wore my mom's lingerie when pubic hair. My first pubic hair came and I shaved off immediately. I've always um, talked. I had more. The vast majority of my friends have been women. And even as an LDS Republican, I had things like I wanted to know Heavenly Mother, and I cried about being able to know Heavenly Mother more. I put myself on a babysitter listing and I was genuinely sad when people were hired, when I was, when I was people that hire me. Um, and working, I worked in Republican politics right out of college, even despite the journalism degree. And let's be honest, social science and humanities degrees, you, you can, doesn't really matter, <laughs> to be honest. But it's the experience. But um, that's really screwed with my ability to understand myself because I was getting paid to demonize people. So, because I work for Utah's governor for a bit, and mm, Congress, yeah. Congressman Utah. even though they're like on a personal level, like they're, they're, they're fun to chat with and like, they're, you know, like they're wrong. Their perception of the world and how they've applied their perception of the world is wrong. So yeah. um, even though they truly, their personalities are fun, but yeah. So what I'm trying to say, what I what I'm trying to get at, it, I'm not just a different person. I it was half metamorphosis and it was half who I was since I was a kid, and yeah. and it wasn't just it wasn't just being confused or being out of the out of the truth and and not knowing and trying to grasp for whatever it was because even as an LDS Republican working in Republican politics, I had these girly things. That I would do publicly and that pub- privately, excuse me. And so I'm trying to say it was during a crazy era when sh- there was so much gaslighting and so many negative messages towards queer people um, and people who truly wanted to just know who they were during during like the Trump administration, for instance, those years, the late 2010s, yeah. were really, were really rough for people like that. 2017 yeah. to 2019. I think it wasn't just invalidating was, queer people, but also I think kind of blaming them for potential, like the potential destruction of the country, that there's something really sinister or like evil afoot kind of a thing too. So, yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. You, so I'm just trying to say that I found myself in the age of Trump and, but that doesn't mean and that it's really a finding myself, and that's I'm I'm not like this whole different new person. I still love Star Wars, just like my eight year old self did, you know. And I'm I'm still I'm still me, with with the addition of self discovery, which yes, that brings a, that brings beautiful things that you learn about yourself and you apply to your life. 
but I'm not like it's not like I killed the other person. That that I still I still watch an animated Star Wars episode. You know, yeah. so it's people can be when people like if somebody medically transitions, they're not like a different person necessarily. They've just found more of who they are. Yeah. No, I I could relate to that, and I think, I, I mean, anyone who grows up in a repressive environment where there's really one specific path or a very narrow set of paths to go to, to, to be considered a productive and, and, you know, quote unquote, good member of society that does create a lot of conflict. And I feel like it is kind of an interesting contradiction that when you can't be your authentic self, you are there, it is you. So there's discovery. So that is new things, but the discovery is the old, the discovery is what's been there all of along, all along. So I, I don't know. I just, the, you're, you're making me think all of these new thoughts. So I feel like I'm tripping over them because I'm still actually just putting them together now in my own brain. But I don't know. I just, I think I find that very beautiful and kind of circular in a way where, yeah, discovering yourself it's just, it's, I don't know, it's just new and old and then and just a sense of like wholeness, I think maybe like, I, I, maybe kind of like a yin and yang kind of a thing. Um, and that, that's just really beautiful to me. And I I feel like I've had, I guess, similar experiences where people feel like that I've changed a lot and I I feel like I haven't also. I feel like, and and on the one hand, I do see, I, I do see a lot of things that I do differently and different ways that I talk and present myself in the world but it's the same thing it's like it's been me all along you just didn't let me be me and I didn't feel strong enough myself to express that and so I held it in and held back and now I don't have to anymore and so I I feel happier and I feel more me and and life's just so much easier without that like weight on there so yeah. Do you feel similarly? Or I, I, I think, I mean, I know you know what I'm saying, because I'm, I'm getting these ideas from you, but I just, I just love it. And I love that you, was, you put these thoughts together in a book, because you'll have something and I, I, I feel like I should do this. I think maybe anyone else in the audience, what a great thing you have now that this has like been put down because um, our memories and our thoughts change, you know, and so uh, I don't think I'll, I, I won't remember a lot of the details about this time period of my life because I'm not writing them down. And so I think not only is it a thing that would be worthwhile for me and then for anyone else in the audience to to be able to have to look back on, but also for, you know, family and also for future generations. Because, I mean, like the story of Mary and Anne, like we we're able to learn from that and admire what they did because we were able to get that information and, and, you know, all this time later, find out who they are. So I don't know. I just, I just love that you've, you've put something out there and um, um, yeah. Did you, Thanks, Mary. yeah, no, do you, I, I'm wondering if, um, what, what made you decide to put it out there actually? Cause I guess you could have done this as just like a personal or, or private journal. So uh, yeah, I'm curious about that. What, um, what made you decide to make it a, a public thing, publicly available? Well, with with a, per, a journalist personality, I like to put things that I've realized out there. <laughs> so yeah, I um, I I do journal, but I also I also like and want to to put it out there for real. Like Sometimes to be, it to be fair. So yeah, no, it makes it easier to pull your thoughts together too sometimes. Cause if uh maybe if you're writing just for you, then there's no not accountability, you know what I mean? But no, um you could stop writing or you and, and no one will know because there isn't anyone else that you're sharing it with. So it, it makes sense to me. Um and you know, like if you have to go through all of this work, why not share it if it helps somebody else? Because we know that there's other people out there like us at various stages and we've gotten to where we are because of people ahead of us who've been able to do things for us and set things up. So I kind of feel like we almost have a responsibility to try to set things up 
for people who are coming after us. And everyone has something kind of unique or, or different. Like your your essays are really different from my experience and, and my changes. And so that's what I loved about it because it was really, it was just really new and different in these contexts that I'm, I'm not as involved in. And so I just feel like there's people, there's people I can reach because of my experiences. And then there's people that you can reach because of yours and, and maybe there's not as much crossover. No. So I feel like the, the more unique, the better because there's somebody out there that, that will need it. So. Absolutely. Yeah. We all, I, I mean, yeah, this is my personal life, but I think, I think we should, um, I should think we should serve things because it's so true that we have, we're, we're unique people and we have unique experiences. So for sure. And I just, I just basically, when I realize something, I just say, I just want to tell the world. <laughs> it's actually very similar to what missionaries for religions have done. Like yeah. in the Mormon, in the Mormon context and Latter-day Saint movement context, people got converted and then they went by and then they went and became missionaries themselves and went out and then said what they said, what they learned yeah. in their perspective. So, so we're just, we're doing what we were taught. It's really similar in that regard. Yeah. The optic is, is similar. Yeah. So what, what's in the, the future for you? Do you think, are you, um, are there more books to be written or is that, are we going to kind of see what, ends up happening with the next election, if it's going to shake things up as we know it, or maybe not. Um, what are you, what are you thinking? Um, I feel to be totally real. I feel a call to use my writing to help transgender women. So I am pursuing that writing as much as I can about it um, for now. And it will, it'll be more in the future. Um, Hopefully the near future because the need is right now. Yeah. Um, and then, is it like and then also I want to do write for other publications. Like where where is um where can your content be found in general? Both, both. Yeah, both. So I write on Medium, um, and then also I do contribute to, to other publications. Also, um, I've had a f so so in the last year, let's say I've had. I've had there's there's been a, quite a bit of content pieces on on Medium, and then also I've written for Translash Media a couple times. Um, so that'll I'll just be, okay. I'll just be doing that as much as I can. Still, and Dean's really good at collecting links, so we should have some down down below. And then I think I, I might have cut you off. So I if you, there was more for you to say, I want you to finish that, but then. My next question is, and I don't want to forget it. I, I want to know if you have any um, advice or things for people to to get their voice out, or uh, you know, just in the current political climate. What what would you like to see more of? If um, if you've got ideas on on that, in terms of advice, I would say um, you might have to you might have to create content for free. Um, plus, you can't you can't really know. Or at least at least show that you're worth being paid until you put some stuff out for free potentially. Um, at least that's my experience. If I'm wrong, I'm just blinded by my ex my experience of what I've had to do. Um, so it's just a, it's just a blind spot. Um, I also would would say like to there's been an increase in personal essays in media in the last several years, and if because there's a demand for it. And so it's, I think it, we're coming, we're actually having a little bit of a revolution, I feel in terms of content, in terms, you see this on TikTok and things too. Uh, not that I'm on TikTok, but I know that that's been a powerful thing for folks in Instagram, even though it's not media, because it's people have actually, media. have actually benefited from, from learning people's stories. Yeah. Oh, sorry, what did you say? And that's well, and stories is something you can share even without pursuing journalism full time like you are. So I think I think TikTok makes it easy for anyone kind of where they're at with without necessarily having to create a podcast or, or write a book. You, if you have a story, you could be an engineer or an accountant or something, um, but yet turn on TikTok and and share a quick rundown of a personal experience that you've had. That can maybe open somebody else's eyes or heart to 
yeah, what's out there? Um, and I hadn't noticed it, but now that, I mean, now that you say it, I do feel like I'm, I am seeing that kind of content more on TikTok feeds and YouTube shorts and things like that. People, people sharing their stories and their lived experiences. And, and you're right, it is impactful. So I, I think that's great advice. Do you, yeah. do you feel yeah. hopeful for the future? Um, like in terms of, I, I know I go through periods of time where I'm like really on fire about things and I think we can turn things mm -hmm. around. We can make things better, like good when we went out in the end. And then, then there are times where it just seems really, um, I'm not so sure. I'm, and so I wonder, do you go through that? And maybe if you do, do you have advice for this kind of uh, cycle if, uh, if others are feeling the same way? You mean do you feel the same cycle? way? Yeah, like, because um, I, I think sometimes I cycling, hear, an election cycle, right? Um, no, I mean, like cycling between uh, moods and just kind of feeling like we've got this, uh, we can win, good will win in the end, like, we'll, we'll, you know, speak what we know, and, and we can turn the tide on this. And that, you know, like, society's been progressing for a while, we've got a lot of pushback, but, but we can win. And then there are other times where I'm just like, I don't know. I don't know if we've got it in us. I don't know if it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better or what's going to happen. And those days are kind of depressing and, I, and it kind of almost feels like nothing's going to change. Um, so yeah. Do you, do you go through cycles like that or do you kind of stay steady on a certain track as far as your hope goes for the future? I'll just say what came to mind. Honestly, at this very moment, it's really wild for, I mean, let's not be narcissistic or it's other people outside of the United States, but like this very yeah. moment, July 7th, it's really nuts in the United States. And I really don't think that's recent, recency bias. It's it's a defining moment for this country. I I don't see how I don't see how it'll be sustainable and America will continue as it's been. I if let's say, I mean, this is very specific and this is very political, but let's say Trump gets elected. I I'm not gonna I just there was three women on his administration who said in in January that we'll have a dictatorship. If he, well, we'll lose democracy if he wins. But I don't, let's be hopeful. Yeah. I think it's elected. I don't know if, um, I don't, maybe we won't necessarily have a dictatorship, but I don't see how America sustains where it's been at because it's, because people who are right wing have become radicalized. Yeah. And so I don't under, I don't, I don't see what, and I'm not even left wing, but right. I recognize this. And so I think the I system's do, broken. You know, and that's how we got here in the first any, place. There, there's gonna have to be a change of course in action. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying that I, there's a feeling that the system is the system's broken and that that's how we got here is because the way we've had it either just hasn't had the right checks and balances, maybe. You know what I mean? Like we're we're facing this because there are some weaknesses in the system. That have been able to be exploited, and so I I agree with you. Something is for sure going to need to change, and it, then it's 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 up to us to decide what that change is going to be. And so we we need to be um, even if even if you do feel if it's hopeless, I think the future generations need us to be trying as hard as we can. So it's our efforts. I think should not be dictated by whether or not we think there's enough of us. To win the fight, uh, I think our efforts should be to do the right thing and try to do the right thing for ourselves and those that we love, regardless of how it looks. And if I think I'm, I'm really hoping we can really get things off to a better start for the next generation. Like in my generation, that's what I really want. But if not, I would like to be able to do like take the next generation as far as I can in my lifetime, so that they have less distance to travel for themselves. So um, hopefully they can make it a, a a good life and a nice life for them. Cause I, yeah, I more than I anything, think... I really want them to be able to be authentic too. And I, I would like them to be able to find it much, much earlier than their thirties, you know, like we did after so many decades and, and living our life <laughs> ways that other people wanted us to, you know, did you have a thought? I, yeah. I feel like there is, I... I, I do think I always have so many thoughts, Maven. <laughs> yeah, but go for it. Go for I, it. I will. I want to say that I think I think our. Well, I want. To, I'll just say a couple of things. I think our generation is is passionate about helping the next generation, and it more more so than other 
generations. And so I think that's better. I also think that our generation is more humanist and um, on people, I mean, this is why personal stories have risen in, in, in personal stories in, in media, social media, although that's, you know, that could be a dumpster fire, but um, there's more of a, there's more of a focus on the, on the, on the individual. There's more of a passion of our generation to help, to help the next generation. And I, I think that there's, um, I think, I think there's a lot of dead wood that insists that has institutions that have been dead wood, if you will, that have covered up, this is going to sound liberal as hell, but that's yeah. covered up a lot of beautiful things and we're that dead wood is finally coming, coming up. And some people are freaking out about it, but hopefully if we can just keep doing that and, and e either way, we need to do it as much as possible. And then, yes. um, and then things will be a lot better and we can, um, that's what I've hoped for is that, is that, um, is that the old God is, is just, if you will, is just, you know, the, 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 the old guy who's yelling, get off my lawn. <laughs> I have to give credit my friend Brenda Julander for this metaphor, yeah. but but she, you know he's like get off my lawn and all cranky and things. I think uh, yeah. that 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 old god is dying and, and wheezing and he's gonna die alone, and we just um, hopefully there's no unintended consequences of that process happening. Yeah, I guess maybe that is the the we all get older. And so the people in power, and it does seem like they're the oldest that they ever have been just, and it's not just the presidency, but also our Senate and everything. And so, yeah, I think there needs to be more, and there will be at some point, like our generations will start filling in those seats and, and hopefully we can, um, yeah. So I guess even no matter what, as, uh, as much as something can maybe move backwards, like the new generations will keep coming and it's really difficult and you can try to indoctrinate, like we know, right? You can try to indoctrinate kids as much as possible into your ideology. But if it just, if it's not compassionate, if it's not based in truth, it really struggles. There's always a struggle against the truth. And there's always people who are going to want the truth more than the indoctrination. So like you're, it's, you can never rest on your laurels. I think when you, um, kind of forcibly take over or try to or just just try to control because I think that's really what this is about trying to control a lot of people that you don't like or that you you don't want them having control of even just themselves but I you just if you try to hold on to some, eventually like you're gonna get tired and your grip slips and then I hopefully we'll be ready we'll be ready when that happens to to bring it and I, I for when you were talking to I was kind of thinking actually in terms of almost like gardening and nature, just the new growth comes from decay. And, you know, sometimes, sure. yeah, it takes almost drastic actions. If a, if a tree is just really diseased or just really misshapen and it's just, you know, it can become a danger to itself, um, either splitting itself uh, because of weird distributions of weight or maybe falling on a house or something. So sometimes we have to kind of move that process along and end something or, or quit something that maybe used to be great when it was a little bit different, you know, until something happened and just say, okay, it's time to move on from this and let there be new growth, let there be something new and beautiful. So, yeah. That is such a good, that is such a good allegory. And also it's like, yeah, it's not like a problem. It's just like, it's time. Like there was something that worked in the past and now it's just time. It's not like it's not like you know necessarily people are coming after right wing thought or anything. It's or or right leaning religion. It's just it. There's there was a time and a season, and mm -hmm. and then we just we just learn we just learn from the past and move forward. That's a good point, actually, because I, I I do tend to maybe maybe over demonize the other side sometimes, and that's I think because I've I've come from there. Um, and I'll have to think on this more, but I think you're right. There, there maybe was a time where these kinds of ideals that I, I mean, I, I just see as like ignorant and and bigoted, and so they they always were, whether or not they were more accepted more or less in the past. But if we're not looking at that, but we're we're looking at kind of the mindset in general, um, maybe that is kind of part of the cycle of civilizations is that 
at least to get a foothold in some places, this kind of thinking uh, is what was necessary and is what was needed to get something going. And maybe just as a species, because we've already been through a lot when you when you look at, you know, way back in, uh, you know, I, evolution in the days where, where you could kind of say like the first I guess great ape really started to walk upright and we our physiology started changing and we got language and things there's i think there's been a lot of progression and so i kind of hope that this can continue and that maybe our, our brains were also over generations start to change and be more globally communal rather than tribalistic and i i do think that's possible like and and that would be evolution so i think it, it, and, it and it might be inevitable maybe maybe we feel like we're we're fighting this fight and it's just, it's just going to happen anyway. Otherwise we'll wipe ourselves out, you know, but I, I do. Um, yeah. Like maybe I think uh, perhaps we're just in a really a new age as human beings because we're so globally connected and not separated by oceans and, and mountain passes and things like that, that um, yeah, maybe there's another, a new step up in our, our, I, I mean, I'm thinking our bodies will change, but I think oh. the brain mostly. Yeah, we we can hope. We can hope. You know. Yeah, I maybe think someday we will be like self interconnected as as a global yeah. world too. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, no. I was, I was thinking uh, the Star Wars actually kind of bringing it back into like maybe there someday if if we can get to this point, maybe someday we will be able to like reach out. Maybe there will be intergalactic uh, trades and, and federations and maybe like, there is part of a like even greater system perhaps you know and I, I i don't know i just liked that idea that it just kind of popped in my head that like may, maybe this is where we're heading uh if we can get there if we can manage to survive as a species that long um it's a it's a fun idea i don't know if nasa and the millennium falcon would connect on the edge of the solar system or anything like that and i'm not saying that's yeah. what you said but yeah i think i yeah, I, I get what you mean, but um, but no, with globalization, I don't, I don't see how, I don't see how right, I don't see how right wing belief, religious, political, because that seems to be very much the same on mm -hmm. that side. I don't see how that and globalization are compatible. That just doesn't make sense. So as we continue to be globalized, I just think it's, I do, I do think it's a change, just a societal change. Yeah, and it's just you know, like it's because it seems um, very like exclusionary. Yeah, whereas globalization, like you, you have to open up your arms and and allow more people in. And there's a point where you you can't just be scared of things that you don't understand or that are different from you. Exactly. I mean, otherwise, I think for a lot of you, for a lot of LDS people in Utah, it's, you're gonna have to choose between, you know, breaking your religious beliefs break from your political beliefs or just doubling down on Utah's the best go jazz and and just trying to ignore reality and so yeah I think anyway. I, pretending we're already great can prevent us from being even greater and I kind of feel like that's where because if we're saying we can be greater then it's like saying we're not great now and we want to be great now so there's a narrative there that can be useful I think um, I, I take more interest in looking outside of even the world, you know, since I believe there's life beyond us and maybe it's too, maybe it's unrealistic to expect to ever connect with outside life, which I know is an assumption, but it seems pretty clear given, given footage from, uh, from the Pentagon and things, but, um, but what I, 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 either way to look inward, mm -hmm. to look inward to America or even inward to Utah, as I believe a lot of Latter-day Saints still do, is not, is not what we should be doing. Uh, at the end of the day, we're just, we're just all trying to figure it out on this blue marble. And so, and so definitely looking inward is not, I don't think it's worked that well. And it's definitely something that we need to move past. That's a good, a good point. Although I'm thinking like in terms of what we talked about earlier, like with personal journeys, there sometimes has to be a going back and looking inward in order to move forward. And 
so so now I'm wondering if maybe that is part, maybe maybe part My of. My bad. Reason. I meant I, I meant governmentally. Oh, governmentally. Yeah, I, I didn't mean personally. I You're thinking more like nationalism and stuff in terms yeah. of like the societally, yeah. Yeah. So sorry. But but even then, because it it does it still seems similar to me because I mean as as a nation like. The, the idea of nationalism is is that like we're the best group they are not they are our enemies and and we need to win um you know but for those of us who are trying to you know trying to look at the real history versus the whitewash one and, and deal with that and you know what i mean i i feel like this looking back and and reconciling with the past is a way to move forward and that that unwillingness to do that and to just look inward like you're saying governmentally or, or just just to see ourselves as like this tribe that we're fine as is and we don't need to apologize and we don't need to question anything we just need to keep things as they are uh, really stops the the progress or am i completely off base here am i am i missing your point still i'll give an example of something i was thinking of just this morning yeah i lived in i lived in the i lived in the manti um ephraim area prior to mm -hmm. moving to los angeles 17 months ago and I, 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 I know that Brigham Young would tell different, different Latter-day Saints to go to different places and settle. So he sent yeah. some people. I'm, I'm living in Manta. I learned this. He sent, he sent people to, to that area, and they built the Manta Temple and they established and stuff. And I felt bad because I was like, well, they believed, they believed because Brigham Young told them they, they had to build there and were there the rest of their life, because. I mean, it's hard for me to believe they never, they never questioned this, but they, it was a different time. They didn't have the internet, didn't have other info. And so, or much, Even you know, they not question, too long now. There's nothing they could do about it, really. They were pretty well stuck, I think. Yeah. 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 So, so they just lived in this, they just lived in this really bland area for the rest of their life after building the temple and establishing the community there. And, and, you know, they very well were just like, okay, like, this is what God wants me to do. And it's hard for me to, with the in, with the access to information now, people can lose their beliefs in the LDS church in a few clicks now, you know, and I guess 3D32 pages or, or what, you know what I mean? To, get, yeah. to, to do that. But but um, I don't see how we go back to that. I don't, it seems to be bigger. There seems to be more info unless we, we think more broadly and that's my yeah. I guess what I'm really saying in terms of inward versus outward in terms of thinking. Oh, and okay, yeah. I guess that's woke. I don't know, but 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 what what's it, what if 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 the alternative is I have to stay in it's in Manti the rest of my life be, because God like I don't I don't even I don't even know if millennial and Gen Z Latter Day Saints even think that way anymore. So yeah. the LDS okay. Church themselves said it, said you don't have to go to Utah. Utah's not, you know, the Utah's not Zion. At least that yeah. officially was said in the seventies from Bruce McConkey. So, so I don't yeah, see how we can. I don't see how we go back. To, yeah. Yeah. So I don't see okay. how we go back to that sort of thinking, and I don't see even those who work in accounting or work in finance or whatever can can actually defend. Oh yeah, you have to be in Manti the rest of your life because because Brigham Young. Right. Yeah. Okay. That makes, that makes sense. I think I understand better where you're coming from, where it's, um, yeah, I was thinking like, look, it, as far as history and looking in the past and stuff, but you're, you're talking about just, I mean, information and interactions, like it, we can't be little social islands anymore. I, I, I think we have progressed beyond that as the species, or you have to at least try really, really hard to cut the rest of the world out. Whereas in the past, that was the default and it took effort to connect and to get through the mountains or to get across the ocean and make it. Now it's kind of flipped um, and you, you have to basically build your own compound or something. And even then um, the outside world is just too big. And so there's more people than you. So, you, you, you know, if, if there's interest, if there's a reason, you know, you, you just can't do it anymore. Um, or you can, as long as the outside world allows you to. And I, the question is, I don't think we should even want to because I, I don't know that we've ever seen any actual utopia be 
formed in any kind of a compound. Um, <laughs> it always seems to be, it always seems to like just degenerate into absolute chaos and authoritarianism as, as far as I'm aware of. And yeah, I, I think we're done with that. I'm, I think I'm ready. I think as, as a society and as a species, I hope we can get beyond and, and past that. So anyway, these were, these are pretty deep topics. I think we went on today, but, but this is how, like, I, I like the way that you think and, and, just the way you wrote these little essays, they might seem really different, but I just, I, I just like how grounded it is. Your your personal thoughts, but also with your outside context and uh, environment. Um, do you have any final thoughts to share on that? And I, I'm, if not, we can go ahead and wrap up and put the link to your book down below. But um, yeah, I'll give I'll give you the uh, the last word. Oh, that's nice. Um... I'll just say that I like on my I went on my mission in New Jersey from 2008 to 2010. I'm adding to what I just said. So, folks there who had converted in New Jersey, with some, I knew a few folks that moved to Utah, even though the LAS Church no longer required moving to Utah. It's been a long time since that point. So I just I'm saying that we just need to get it past these last vestiges of that sort of thinking, and I and I I, I appreciated. The, the opportunity to write very good for me uh it happened from 2017 to 2019 march 2017 to july 2019 it was published and it, it was just a really tremendous opportunity for me to be able to write as i was in the throes of you know it was a time where i couldn't even i couldn't even appear to my parents and address like men well I mean, but like I, mm. in my mind i was like no way you know it was more like i go to a hospital than go to my parents that way so it was a great opportunity I was. I'm glad. I, I'm glad I enjoy writing because it gave me a good opportunity to, to do that in a time where I was like, I just can't. I just can't be myself. So yeah. And thanks for having me. Also. Yeah, my pleasure. So look for that link below, and then I guess look for Alicia's name and bylines uh, where you, where you read, and uh, hopefully, hopefully we see a lot more of you in the future. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> And then and I, I always forget this part too. So don't don't forget to like and subscribe um, and give us a comment down below if there's anything that really reached you or, or any any new thoughts that you got from this. Or, or if you've thought of writing your own book, tell us about that. Thanks, everybody.